It's like the, em like the emperor's new clothes. Only the wise can see them. Okay. Now, we come to a very, very fascinating and controversial part of Romans, a section that begins in chapter 9 and continues unbroken through chapter 11. Some of Paul's discussions are that long. Uh, in, for example, in 1 Corinthians, chapters 12, 13, and 14 are a single discussion about the, you know, the gifts of the Spirit and so forth. But some extended discussions have to be broken into several chapters, but they're one... It could be one long chapter as far as the logic of it goes. Because it starts reasoning at the beginning of chapter 9 and reaches its conclusion at the end of chapter 11. We will not read verse by verse every uh, part of this, these chapters because it takes a long time and we have a short time to do it in. But I want to say the subject is Israel. And we need to ask ourselves, why does Paul go off on this at this point? And then the next question is, what is he saying about it? Now, I will tell you that there are many, and I certainly was among them at one time, who believe what Paul is arguing here is that there's a future for the nation of Israel. Most of us probably have come from churches, or are still in churches, that believe that God has a special plan for the people of Israel in the end times. They are his chosen people. They were chosen through certain promises God made to Abraham. They are descended from Abraham. God said certain things would apply to Abraham's seed. The Jews today, they say, are, are Abraham's seed, and therefore uh, there are certain promises that God has not yet fulfilled to them. And the idea is they will be fulfilled in the future. Uh, it's essentially... Up the promise of salvation. Let me, let me show you some Old Testament verses just so we'll know what we're, what, what's behind this idea. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse 17, Isaiah says, But Israel is saved by the Lord. Now, I'm not, I think in the Hebrew it may be ambiguous, but most translations put this in the future tense. Israel will be saved in the Lord with everlasting salvation. You shall not be put to shame or confounded to all eternity. This basically promises salvation to Israel. In Isaiah 46, in verse 13, I bring near my deliverance. It is not far off. My salvation will not tarry. I will put salvation in Zion, that means Jerusalem, for Israel, my glory. God will bring salvation to Israel, to Jerusalem, okay? In Jeremiah chapter 23, just giving you a few verses of the same sort so you'll know what is the background that Paul is uh, working from. Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah chapter 23. Now, he doesn't quote these verses, but he presupposes that these verses express a general belief that the Jews had based on a lot of verses such as these. Namely, that God ultimately would save the nation and the people of Israel. Okay? Jeremiah 23, verse 6, it says, In his days, and this is the Messiah, this is a messianic prophecy. I could read verse 5. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, that's the Messiah, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. So Israel and Judah will be saved in his days. Whose days? The branch who will reign in righteousness and justice. So the Jews always had this idea, the Messiah is going to come. He's going to set up a kingdom and reign over the world. And there will be nothing left but righteousness and justice, and that will be the circumstances in which he will save all the Israelites. Now, I will say this, that in the Old Testament, the Israelites did not have a clear picture of salvation in the sense that we do. We think of salvation as eternal life. There's not much in the Old Testament to encourage belief in eternal life. The term is found one time in Scripture in the prophecy of Daniel in terms of a resurrection. But 
for the most part, the Old Testament does not focus on talk about promise eternal life. That's something that's revealed more in the New Testament. Paul said in Timothy that, that God has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Life and immortality, they weren't brought to light in the Old Testament. They exist, but they weren't talked about. So salvation to Israel means something more national. In the Old Testament, they were to be saved from their enemies. The Assyrians had destroyed their nation and scattered them. The Babylonians had scattered them, and only a remnant had ever returned. And to the Jew today, if you ask the average informed Orthodox Jew today, why don't you believe Jesus is the Messiah? They might give any number of answers, but part of their answer would be this. The Messiah, when he comes, is going to bring the Israelites back to, to Israel. He's going to bring the diaspora back home. Jesus did not gather the scattered Israelites back home to Israel. Therefore, he's not the Messiah. Now, this is the salvation. The salvation of the nation from its captivity in, in foreign lands is really what Israel in the Old Testament understood salvation to be and what many Israelites still do because they're not Christians. They don't, they're not focused on something like eternal life. They're focused on national redemption, national restoration. That's salvation for Israel as far as most Jews thought in Old Testament times and many would still think today. In Jeremiah 30 in verse 10, one other verse, then we'll get to Romans. Jeremiah says, But as for you, have no fear, my servant Jacob, says the Lord. That's Israel. Do not be dismayed, O Israel, for I am going to save you from far away and your offspring from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return and have quiet and ease, and no one shall make him afraid. This is, again, this is a verse that says very clearly what I was just saying. God saving them means saving them from the nations far away where they've been driven from their homeland and bringing them back and making them uh, you know, a secure nation in the world. Again, and reigned under the Messiah who would reign with justice and righteousness. This is the messianic hope that the Jews had. Salvation, which included a national salvation. Now, Paul, at the end of chapter 8 has said, you know, nothing can separate God's elect from him. All things work together for good to those who are the called according to his purpose. So aren't the Jews the called? Aren't the Jews elect? How come they're not saved? This is the, nat the natural question that the Jewish element, especially in his readership, would be asking. They might be non-saved Jews who are asking it as a challenge to Paul's Christian message, or they might even be saved Jews who are still wondering, when is this going to happen? Remember the saved Jews, the disciples, in Acts 1-6, just before Jesus is said, they said, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They're, are you going to do this now? Is this when the restoration is going to come of the nation? And they were believing Jews. So both believing Jews and non-believing Jews would be struggling with the fact that Jesus is supposedly the Messiah and has brought salvation. And yet, if God is faithful to his elect and, and, and nothing can separate them from God and, and uh, all things work together for those who are called, certainly Israel was called. Certainly Israel was the elect. How come God hasn't saved them? They seem separated. If, if Christianity is true, then the Jews who don't believe in Christ are not saved, and that's the majority of the Jews. Only a remnant of the Jews have really received Christ. And if, if, all, if the majority of Jews are still lost, how can it be that Jesus is the Messiah who is supposed to save the Jews? Why aren't the Jews saved is really the question. That's the question raised, and it's the question answered in these chapters. Now Paul's going to raise the question by implication in the first five verses of chapter 9. He's going to answer the question very briefly in verse 6, and then he's going to unpack his answer in the remainder of the discussion. So the question is implied in what he says in verse 5, or in verse, the first five verses. The question is answered in a single sentence in verse 6, and then it's unpacked and expounded on for the rest of the chapters. Now let me just tell you why this is a controversial pa uh, section among Christians. <clears throat> because Christians don't all agree about Paul's answer. They don't all agree about what it means for Israel to be saved. For most of history, Christians have believed 
that Jesus' salvation of Israel is a salvation of the faithful remnant of Israel who came to Christ and became Christians. And that the salvation is spiritual, not national or geographical. National geographic. It's not a national geographic salvation. It's, it's, a, it's a, a salvation in a spiritual sense. Salvation from sin, not salvation from Romans, for example, or Babylonians or Assyrians. Now, the New Testament writers appear to spiritualize salvation, and even the spiritualized Israel in many cases. Paul has already said back in Romans 2, he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward of the flesh. He's a Jew who is one inwardly. And he even said that it will not an uncircumcised man who nonetheless keeps the law be counted as circumcised. He said that also in Romans chapter 2. Paul's saying you don't have to be really a circumcised Jew to be a, a circumcised Jew as far as God's concerned. And in, in this passage, in Romans 9, 6, he says, uh, they are not all Israel who are of Israel. By, by that he means those who are of Israel would be the, all those who descended from Jacob, from Israel. But not all of them are the Israel to whom the promises were made. They're only made to the remnant. Now this has been the view of the church for, of most of the church for 20 centuries. The church fathers believe this. The Roman Catholics believe it. The reformers believe this. Evangelicals have believed this. Until the 1800s. And then came dispensationalism. Dispensationalism says, no, that's not what it's saying. God still is going to save national Israel. It's not a remnant of Israel. It's all Israel will be saved. Doesn't Paul say that in Romans eleven twenty six? So all Israel will be saved? And so the dispensational view has seen this whole section differently. Paul is not saying, as the church has usually thought of what he's saying, he's not saying that God has fulfilled the promises. He has and is presently saving the true Israel. Every Jew who turns to Christ is saved. Every Jew who is part of the faithful remnant, therefore, is saved. And, and the promise is for the remnant, not for the whole nation, not for the whole the race. God doesn't save people racially. He saves them on the basis of faith. And those Jews who have faith are part of that faithful remnant. Therefore, the promises that he would save Israel are fulfilled and are being continuously fulfilled as the remnant of Israel continues to come to Christ. It's a present and continuing reality. The, the promise is therefore fulfilled. Christ did come and has saved the true Israel. That's, the, that's what the church has always taught. But the dispensational view arose just 150 years ago, Don. Maybe a little less. And, um, and said, no, what Paul's actually saying is this. The promises in the Old Testament of God regathering the nation of Israel back to their land and saving them, even, even in the sense of them coming to Christ, these promises are going to be fulfilled, but they're not associated with what Christ did at his first coming. They are associated with the second coming. And they say what Paul is really arguing here is that although the promises have not been fulfilled yet, they are going still to be fulfilled. But that God has in the meantime saved a remnant as sort of a proof that someday he'll save the rest, sort of like a first fruits of the harvest is sort of a guarantee that the harvest is coming. So the dispensational view is that what Paul is arguing here is that, yes, it is, God has not saved the Jews yet. Christ has not saved Israel yet. The promises of the Old Testament, thus the salvation of Israel, have not occurred, but they will still occur. They are unfulfilled promises, but God is faithful and will bring them about. And that's what Paul's talking about here. So I want you to see two totally different paradigms. If the first one, the, the historic view of the church is correct, namely that God has fulfilled those promises, but they're spiritually fulfilled, and they were always intended to be spiritually fulfilled, to the remnant, the faithful remnant, not the whole nation or the whole race of Israelites. If that's true, then there is no particular value in being Jewish today or any particular significance in the race of Jews or, or the nation of Israel. You see, those who see that significance as continuing are the dispensationalists. Dispensationalists say, see, God is beginning to fulfill those Old Testament promises. He's beginning to save Israel. He's bringing the Jews back to their land. 
And this is the fulfillment of what those Old Testament promises are. And, and because dispensationalism believes this to be true, the assumption is Israel's very important. We should be very much interested in what's going on in Israel. We're watching the prophetic clock ticking rapidly toward the second coming of Christ. This is very encouraging. The most important fulfillment of prophecy in history was the return of, the, of the Israel to become a nation in 1948. And we're living in the last days. And that's the marker. Now, how many of you have heard something along those lines before? I have. That's all I ever heard. <laughs> that's all I ever heard because I was raised dispensational. How, how many of you think I still think that? Hmm, I didn't hide my view very well, did I? <laughs> well, I, I now believe what the church always believed because I didn't know what the church always believed. I was raised indoctrinated in dispensationalism and, and figured that, that that's the way the church believes. And then I found out there are better arguments for a different view, in my opinion. Each one must make their own choice. But when it comes to following Paul's train of thought, to my mind, it's not difficult. He starts by saying, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To, to them belong the patriarchs. From them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all God, blessed forever. Amen. And it says, look at all the advantages the Jews have had. Now, this is not the first time in Romans that Paul has brought this up. Remember, after he talked about they are not really Jews who are outward Jews, but only those who are inward Jews, at the end of chapter 2, the next verse, chapter 3, verse 1, what profit is there in circumcision? Is there any benefit in being Jewish? He says, oh yeah, there's a tremendous benefit. To them we're given the oracles of God. They've had a great advantage. But in verse 9 of that same chapter, chapter 3, verse 9, he says, but are the Jews any better than Gentiles? Oh no, unfortunately not. Now, Paul's not going a different direction here. He's going the same direction as he did in chapter 3. He was briefer there. Do the Jews have any advantages? They've had an immense advantages. They were given the oracles of God, he said in chapter 3. Here he, he lists even more. They had the patriarchs, they had the promises, they had the adoption. God gave them all this stuff. He even brought them aside through and to them. No nation has had those kinds of advantages. And the implied question is, well then if that's true and the Messiah has come, why are most of the Jews not saved? Why are they not believers? Why hasn't God fulfilled those promises? And Paul answers it in verse 6. It is not as though the word of God has failed. He's Now, frankly, the dispensational view sh should have Paul saying, the word of God has only failed for the time being. Later it'll be fulfilled. But it has, arguably, it has failed up to this point. And even dispensationalists will say, the Jews were in fact cast off because of the rejection of Christ, but only temporarily he's going, to re he's going to restore them and own them again. And so Paul should have said, if he was a dispensationalist, it's not as if the, the failure of the promise of God is permanent, because there's going to come a time when these promises will be fulfilled. No, he said, it's not as though the word of God has failed. He's talking about the promises they made about Israel. They have not failed. If they haven't failed then they've come true. And he says, for not all Israelites truly belong to Israel. Now the promise was God would save Israel. Which Israel? The one that means all Israelites or that other Israel that not all Israelites are? He's using the word Israel. Actually, he says they're not, it, the word Israelite here is different than Israel, only in the English translation here. In the Greek, it's the same. Not all are Israel, who are of Israel, is what he says, which sounds like a contradiction, but he's saying the word Israel can be used two different ways. There's that Israel which is all Israelites, and that's brought out in the way this particular translation renders it. Not all the Israelites are really Israel. God made promises to Israel, but that does not include all Israelites. Well, who does it include? It includes, as we shall see, the faithful remnant within that nation. Now, in case anyone's not clear that that's what Paul believed, you'll see, if you look at uh, a few verses later, 
verse 27. And we're not going to skip over all the verses of Missouri, but I just want to point out. Verse 27, he says, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. It's a quotation from Isaiah 10, 22 and following. Though the number of the children of Israel were like the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. Now, Isaiah is the one who said that God would save Israel. But they said, oh, though the Israelites racially as a group may be as numerous as the sand of the sea, just like God promised Abraham that his descendants would be as numerous as the sand of the sea, that may be true, but only a remnant of them will be saved. Paul says, listen, we're not... There are no promises that are intended to be applied to the entire Jewish race. It is the faithful remnant within the Jewish race that God has promised salvation to, and he has done that. He has not failed. His promises have not failed. The word of God has not failed. He has, in fact, saved Israel, but you have to know what he meant by Israel. Not all Israelites are Israel. The children of Israel might be like the multitude of the sands of the sea, but only a remnant of them are the Israel that God has promised to save. Important to note, because later on in Romans 11:26, 26, near the end of this discussion, he's going to say all Israel are saved. Or he says all Israel will be saved. And we have to understand that Paul is not schizophrenic here. When he says all Israel will be saved, he's already said not all who are of Israel are Israel. The ones who will be saved are, he's already told us, the remnant. Not the whole nation, the remnant. Who are the remnant of Israel? Well, the disciples who followed Jesus were a re the faithful remnant of Israel. They were Jewish. Everyone who followed Jesus in the first, in, during his lifetime and in the early days of the church, all those 3,000 who were saved at the day of Pentecost and, the, and thousands more that were saved afterwards when the gospel was only preached in Jerusalem, they were Jews. They came to faith. They're the faithful remnant. God was indeed saving the faithful remnant of Israel. That's the true Israel. The Israel that was represented by people like Caiaphas and Judas Iscariot and other wicked Jews, they're not the true Israel, and they're not saved. They're part of the larger apostate Israel. There is no, there is no prediction in the Bible that all the apostate Jews are going to turn around and become believers and followers of Jesus. There's no scripture that states that unambiguously. I don't think there's any, any scripture that even implies that. What it does say is there is a true Israel that God has drawn out of the larger Israel. It's a remnant, and he has saved them. And that's the only ones he ever really promised to them. In Isaiah 10, 22, he's explicit. Only the remnant of them will be saved. And so, I believe that Paul's argument is not God has postponed the fulfillment of his promises to Israel, but God has fulfilled them in a way that you didn't understand. You thought all the Jews would be brought back to their land and be, you know, worshipers of God and it's all be beautiful again. We'll all be singing Kumbaya. But the, he says that's, that's not the way God meant it. That's not the way God planned it. That's not the way God even said it. He said only the remnant would be saved, so let's not go beyond what God promises here. In passages that says Israel will be saved in the Old Testament, Paul's saying it will be and is being saved. The true Israel are. But that Israel that that promise applies to really means the faithful in Israel, not the unfaithful in Israel. Okay? Now, that's what Paul says. That's what he means. Now, I want to show you a verse also a little later on in chapter 11. We're going to take verses that are in between. I want to just kind of give you the skeleton here of his argument. Chapter 11, he says, I asked then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how that he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They've demolished your altars. I alone am left and they're seeking my life. But what is the divine reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at this present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it's by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Now, 
the question at the beginning of chapter 11 is often misunderstood. Again, historic Christianity sees it one way, dispensationalism sees it another. Paul says, I ask you, has God rejected his people? The dispensationalist view is that Paul is saying, has God finally and permanently rejected his people, the nation of Israel? If, if Paul meant that, he, maybe he should have added the word permanently, because that's what they think he means. He doesn't imply that that's part of the question. He says, has God cast off his people? Now, at this moment, has he cast off his people? Now, dispensationalists argue that God has in fact cast off the Jews for the time being, but he's going to restore them. It's part of the dispensational system that although the promises to Israel remain to be fulfilled in the end times, in the inter from the time of the, the cross until the time of the rapture of the church, they would say, basically, um, God has cast off Israel, but he's going to take them back. God says, Paul says, has he cast them off? He has not cast off his people. But wait a minute. He has cast off the unbelieving Jews like he has cast off the unbelieving Gentiles. Unbelieving Jews are not saved and unbelieving Gentiles are not saved. So what's he talking about? Has he cast off his people? He says, not at all, by no means. I myself am an Israelite. What's that got to do with anything? If, if Paul is arguing, as the dispensations think, that Paul is going to say, well, God has temporarily cast off the Jews. True, because they reject Christ. But the day will come when he's going to take them back and restore and fulfill the promises he made to them in the end times. If that's his argument, then what in the world does his statement, I'm a Jew, have to do with his answer to, his, to the question? Now, if his answer to his question is really, has God cast off his genuine people? No. Even Jews today can be saved. I'm one. There is a remnant. And that's what he goes on to say. He says, in the days of Elijah, Elijah thought he was all alone, but God had reserved 7,000 who had not bowed the knee to Baal. He says, even so, at this present time, there is a remnant. He's not talking about some future time. Paul is not talking about eschatology here. When Paul's thinking about Israel, he's not thinking about eschatology. He's talking about this present time, he said. His argument is not that there will someday be a salvation of the Jews, but that there is at this present time what God promised there would be, the salvation of the remnant. Even at this moment, he says, there's a remnant. I'm one of them, he says. Now, his discussion about, I'm a Jew, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. By implication, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, so obviously I'm a saved Jew. What would that have to do with anything about questions about the future? If Paul, you see, dispensations always love to quote this first verse, has God cast off his people? Not at all. You see, God has not cast off Israel. He's going to restore them in the last time. Well, the question does not is, has he permanently cast them off, as if to say, someday that'll change. He's not asking about future things or changed things or temporary things. What about right now? Has God cast them off? His people, no. Unbelieving Jews, yes. But unbelieving Jews are not his people. And Paul actually makes that statement this way when he says in verse 2, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Well, it's not entirely clear why he uses the term whom he foreknew, but he used it earlier, you might recall. In chapter 8 and verse 29, whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. He's talking about Christians. The ones that God foreknew are the Christians, including Paul, who happened to be a Jewish Christian, and there were Jewish Christians in the Church of Rome, along with Gentile Christians. There are Israelites who are saved because they believe. He's going to go on and talk about the olive tree, uh, the olive tree later on in this same chapter and how that there are Jews that are not part of that tree anymore because of their unbelief. They've been cut off like branches. They're not part of Israel anymore. And Gentiles who have believed have been grafted into that tree. That tree is Israel. And they are now Israel. Israel, therefore, is made up of the faithful. Now, some people say, well, wait a minute, you just said Gentiles are part of Israel. That doesn't make sense. Maybe we could agree that some Jews are not saved because they're lost but, and don't believe in Jesus, but the real Israel would then be made up of Jewish people who are the saved segment of the Jewish population. Those few Jews who came to Christ and do come to Christ, they are Israel, but the Gentiles are not Israel. Lots of people want to make that point. They're wrong. 
Remember, Paul said he is a Jew who's one inwardly. And even an uncircumcised man, if he keeps the law, Paul said, will be counted as circumcised. A Gentile is also counted as uh, Jew. And here's the issue. This is what many people do not understand. God has never been one who judges people by race. A person who judges someone by their race rather than their individual merit is what we would call a, a racist. That's the very definition of racism. That you evaluate a person not by their merits or by their character, but by what race they belong to. Either you think one race is superior to another or inferior to another, that's racism. The opposite of racism is that everybody's the same as far as race is concerned, but not everyone's the same in terms of character and choices. And God judges people on their character and choices. Now what's interesting here, I did see your hand. Do you want to ask a question right this way? Yes, the Israel God, yeah. Yeah, in Galatians 6, 16, Paul says, uh, you know, peace on those who keep this commandment and on the Israel of God. Uh, he's referring to those, the, the believers in, in Galatia as part of the Israel of God, and they were mostly Gentiles. Now, of course, dispensationalists say, no, he's talking about the Gentiles and the Israel of God separately. And that's a dispute that we could win, but we don't have the time to bother with it right now. But yeah, that is an important verse. But what I want you to understand about what Israel ever was, Israel, although it started with a man named Israel and his children and their children and their children and their children who multiplied into a great family in Egypt, they were, not a, they were not an identifiable nation. They were just a big family. When they came out of Egypt with Moses, they came to Mount Sinai and God made them into the nation of Israel. But who was there at Mount Sinai? Abraham's offspring and others. It was a mixed multitude, the Bible says. In Exodus chapter 12, it says a, a mixed multitude went out of Israel with, out, out of Egypt with them. So there were some Gentiles, mostly Israelites, no doubt. But there were not all Israelites. There were Edomites and Egyptians and others we read about later on in Numbers and so forth among them. This was a racially mixed group, predominantly made up of people descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but not entirely. But when they all came to Mount Sinai, God made a covenant and said, if you keep my covenant, if you obey my voice, you'll be my kingdom, you'll be my special nation. That's when Israel became a nation. And it was made up on what basis? Not a racial basis, a covenant basis. Most of the people there truly were Israelites, but not all. Some were Gentiles. But God said to the whole group, if you keep my covenant, you'll be my nation, my holy nation. Okay? So keeping the covenant is what made someone Israel. And also, by the way, as you read the law of the Old Testament, you'll find that certain times, you know, if an Israelite would worship an idol or do some other thing that's a, a breach of the covenant, they'd be cut off from the people. Remember that expression? Many, many times. That if anyone does this, they'll be cut off from the people. Breaking the covenant removes you from the nation of Israel. You're not part of it anymore. But a Gentile who wanted to keep the Passover could get circumcised and keep the law, become what we call a proselyte, and they'd be a covenant-keeping Gentile. They'd be part of Israel. The Bible says they'd be like a native of the land. So what, what are we saying? You read the law of Moses and you find God made a covenant with a mixed racial group, predominantly of Jewish or uh, what we call Israelite origin, but a mixed racial group and gave them laws and said, you keep these laws, you're in. A Gentile who wants to keep them can be in too. Uh, you break these laws, you're out. A Jew who breaks them is out. In other words, the constituency of Israel is not made up of all Jews and no Gentiles. It's some Jews and some Gentiles. A Jew could be kicked out for breaking the covenant. A Gentile could come in for keeping the covenant. The covenant is what divides Israel. Faithfulness to God's covenant is what makes someone a true Israelite. In the Old Testament, that hasn't changed in the New. What has changed in the New is there's a new covenant. Being Israel still is defined by being faithful to God's covenant. It's just that he scrapped an old covenant that was imperfect and made a new covenant with the house of Israel. That's what it says in Jeremiah he would do. That's what Jesus said he was doing in the upper room. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink it. You're coming in. Okay? Who do you say that to? To Jewish people. Which ones? The ones that believed in him. The ones who were faithful to him. He, they came into the covenant and they were now the true Israel. Because the 
the Israelites that, that tried to still identify themselves by the Old Covenant were not obedient to the New Covenant. Now it says in Hebrews 8.13, Hebrews 8.13 says where there's a New Covenant, the Old Covenant is obsolete. You're not married to two people at the same time. You're married to one at a time. If you're properly divorced from one person, you might be married to another person. But you're not, you're not in two covenant relationships at the same time. The new covenant makes the old one obsolete. There is a new one. The old one is obsolete. Therefore, being defined as Israel cannot be based on being faithful to the old covenant because that's obsolete. God has made a new covenant. Being Israel now is still not a racial issue. It's a covenant issue. Jews and Gentiles alike can be part of it. That's why <coughs> Paul compares Israel to the olive tree, the natural branches, which are the, the, the original branches, the Jews, the ones that didn't believe are cut off. Why? They're not faithful to the new covenant. They're not in because they're not faithful. They, because of their lack of faith, they're cut off the tree. They're not Israel anymore. Gentiles who are faithful to Christ because they have faith in him, they're grafted into the tree. They're part of Israel now. Now, you might say, well, you're, you've been saying here that the olive tree that Paul talks about is Israel. Isn't that a bit of a leap? Paul doesn't say the olive tree is Israel. Well, let me just say, first of all, the whole discussion of Romans 9 through 11 is about Israel, but if you want to be particular about whether an olive tree is the image of Israel, Paul is borrowing the image from Jeremiah 11:16, And... If you're interested in seeing it, you can turn to this passage, Jeremiah 11, 16. God is speaking to Judah, which is Israel at that time, because there's no northern kingdom anymore. All of Israel is now Judah. And he says to them in Jeremiah 11:16, 16, The Lord once called you a green olive tree, fair with goodly fruit. But with the roar of a great tempest, he set fire to it, and its branches will be consumed. Some translations say its branches were broken. The King James and the New King James, for instance, say its branches are broken. But speaking to Israel, you, God calls you a green olive tree. And some of your branches have either been burned up or broken off, one thing or another. This is the image Paul borrows from Jeremiah. He says, okay, the olive tree. Its roots are holy, so the tree is holy. If, if the root is holy, the branches are holy. But the branches have to be attached. And Israel is the olive tree. The Jews originally were born Israelites, but if they have not believed and not come into the new covenant, they are not included in the new covenant arrangement that God made, and they're not Israel. They're not part of the tree anymore. Gentiles have come in. Now, the difference, therefore, between Israel, the olive tree, in the Old Testament and in the New is simply this. It's not that the Old Testament, it was the Jews, and the New Testament's the Gentiles. Dispensationalists hate this theology of mine. They call it replacement theology. Ever heard that term? You've never heard it spoken of positively, I'm sure. Because the term is used only by dispensationalists to describe people like me. Which means people like most of the church throughout history. Who, the reformers, the church fathers, they're all of this viewpoint. Which dispensationalists ad acknowledge. David Hawking, a very avid dispensationalist supporter of national Israel, wrote a book on replacement theology. That is about my theology. And he admits, he says, very early after the death of the apostles, the church became anti-Semitic. And they began to say that the church replaced Israel. Well, you could call it anti-Semitic or you could call it scriptural. To say that the church replaced Israel isn't to become an anti-Semite. I'm not against Jewish people any more than I'm against white Anglo-Saxon Protestant people. I'm not against any race of people. I'm not anti-Semitic. But... I'm also not against the Irish, but I'm not going to say all the Irish are God's chosen people if they're not. Or that all the Nigerians are God's chosen people if they're not. Or the Venezuelans are God's chosen people. I'm not going to say somebody's God's chosen people. That doesn't make me prejudiced against them. I'm not against the Irish. They're just not God's chosen people. I'm not against the Jews. But to say that those of Israel who have not come to Christ have failed to enter into the new covenant is simply to say what the Bible teaches plainly and are not covenant people. What covenant? The old covenant has been become obsolete. So if you say, but God has a covenant with Israel. Well, the covenant you're talking about is obsolete, the Bible says. 
There's a new covenant. He does have a covenant with Israel, but they have to come into the new covenant. Jeremiah said, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And Jesus came and made it, but only the remnant came in. The rest rejected. Because of their unbelief, they're cut off. They're not part of the olive tree. They're not part of Israel. Israel is not a racial group. This is not anti-Semitic. This is pro-Christ. Jesus is the one who defines who's in Israel and who's not. Not your ancestors. God never has saved anyone because of who their ancestors were. And Paul has, has explained that very, very carefully in the first three chapters of Romans. Now, there is a, a, a difficult passage for some people near the end of chapter 11 where, God, where Paul says, all Israel will be saved. I'm going to come to that, but I want to take some of the intervening material first, okay? Because... so. Uh, because of the time limits we have. I'm thinking about what time it is. It's 11.15. You know, I may not give you another break. I may just pile through. We'll see. I may give you a break. We'll see. If you're kind of, if I see you moving around and falling asleep or something, I'll make you stand up. But otherwise, I may not. Okay. Now, having, having talked about Paul's whole discussion about Israel, there's another entire different issue that some people make from Romans 9. And guess who that might be? Who makes that issue? The Calvinists. It's one of their favorite <laughs> verses, too. And, I, and if some of you here are Calvinists, God bless you. I, I'm not against Calvinists. I'm against Calvinism because it's not true, but I'm not against Calvinists. I have no animosity toward Calvinists. But, but I will say that every Calvinist you ever talk to will talk about Romans 9 as if they've, they've won the argument. <laughs> who does that? Nate, well, yeah, well, let's not pick on Nate now. <laughs> but, but here's the passage that they find so uh, necessary to uh, bring up. It says, we looked at the first six verses, but uh, let's go down here, uh, verse 9. For this is what the promise said. About this time I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. Nor, nor is that all. Something similar happened to Rebekah when she had conceived children by one husband, our ancestor Isaac. Even before they had been born or had done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose of election might continue, not by works, but by his call, she was told the elder shall serve the younger. Now the elder twin was Esau. Jacob was the younger twin. So Rebecca was told when they're still in the womb, the elder will serve the younger, which means the, the younger one will be prominent and the elder one will not, which is kind of against normal birth order uh, arrangements in the culture. As it is written, I have loved Jacob, but I've hated Esau. What then are we to say? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So it depends not on human will or, uh, or exertion, <coughs> excuse me, but on God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I have raised you up for the very purpose of showing my power in you so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he chooses and he hardens whomever he chooses. You will then say, what then do, why then does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But indeed, who are you, a human being, to argue with God? Will what is molded say to the one who molds it, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one object for special and another for ordinary use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath, to make his power known, has endured with much patience the objects of wrath that are made for destruction. And what if he has done so in order that he might make known the riches of his glory for the objects of mercy, which he has <clears throat> prepared beforehand for glory, including us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. And then he starts quoting some Old Testament scriptures. This section is one of the most often quoted sections by Calvinists. Why? What does it say about Calvinism? Well, for one thing, it talks about Jacob and Esau. Jacob was chosen. Esau was rejected. This choice was made before either of them were born. It was announced to Rebekah while she was still pregnant. 
And Paul says, obviously, that neither of them had anything good or bad. They, 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 one wasn't a good guy and one a bad guy. He said, this choice was made before they did anything so that the principle of God's election would stand not on what they would do, but on uh, God's sovereign choice. Okay, fair enough. Now, to the Calvinist, this means that Paul is telling us that some people are like Jacob. God has chosen them with, for no reason in themselves to be saved. They're the elect. Other people are like Esau, who for no, through no fault of his own, nothing he ever did had anything to do with it, he was rejected. So these are the non-elect. And the elect go to heaven and the, and the non-elect go to hell. That's, that's how Calvinists understand it. Now he says, now some people might think that's not very fair. And because they think it's not fair, they might say that there's injustice on God's part. Is God being unjust? He says, no way. God can show mercy on who he wants to show mercy on. And he can harden whoever else. He hardened Pharaoh. He hardens whoever he wants to harden. And he shows mercy on whoever he wants to show mercy. It's not a matter of the one who runs or who the one who strives or works. It's of God who shows mercy. Mercy comes from the mercy of God, not people earning it. Okay? Now... All of this, if, if you're a Calvinist, sounds very fine and very, it fits very nicely into the Calvinist paradigm. And if Paul was a Calvinist and wanting to talk about Calvinism in this passage, we might be encouraged to see it that way. On the other hand, we'd have to argue that Paul started talking about one subject, the Jews and the salvation of Israel, which dominates the whole three chapters, but he just kind of got sidetracked and said, let's talk about Calvinism for a while. Then we'll come back to my main subject. Or is this part of his main subject? Did Paul get kind of lost in the weeds here and go off on something so that Calvinists would have a proof text for unconditional election? By the way, they need this one very badly because there is no other passage in the Bible that speaks of unconditional election. They believe in election, and so do I. But I don't believe in unconditional election. The Bible always talks about Christians as being the elect, but Christians are people who have actually met some conditions. They believed in Christ. So it never suggests that we are unconditionally elect. The only passage in the Bible that would support the, seemingly support the idea that God elects people unconditionally is this one. Because it's very specific. Esau and Jacob, the choice was made between them without any reference to anything they did. It was unconditional. It was God's sovereign choice not based on anything they would do. And he has the right to show mercy on one and not the other if he wants to. That's what Paul says. That's unconditional election. I agree it is, but it's not what they think it is. There's no reference here to Jacob being saved and Esau being lost. The choice that God made of the two men has nothing to do with eternal salvation. It has to do with what Paul is talking about in the whole section. That is the whole Romans 9 through 11. What, how, what started this discussion, anyway? It started by saying, in verse 6, not all Israelites are really belonging to Israel. Now, that concept will be strange to many Jews, and Paul is addressing Jews here. Just as he is in the early chapters of Romans, he's working with the Jewish prejudice. They're wondering, how come, if Jesus is the Messiah, Israel's not saved? We're supposed to be seeing more than this, aren't we? And Paul's arguing, not necessarily. Because you're expecting Israel to be saved, but you're thinking of Israel as everybody descended from Israel. Everyone descended from Jacob. And God isn't thinking of it that way. And so Paul begins to explain this fact by saying, what about Abraham? Let's go back, not to Israel, but further back, to Abraham, the grandfather of Israel. Okay? We'll start with him. Then we'll talk about Isaac, the father of Israel. Okay, we're talking about Israel and God's and the fact that not everyone descended from this bloodline is the chosen one. That God has not made a promise that applies to everyone from the bloodline. This is what Paul's arguing. Not all Israelites are, are the Israel we're talking about here. Now, how can I prove that God has not chosen everybody from the bloodline? Well, let's go back to Abraham. How many kids did he have? Eight, actually. After Sarah's death, he married a woman named Keturah and had six more children. But during the lifetime of Sarah, he had two, Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael was the older one, so by natural pro, you know, uh, processes, he'd normally be the heir. But God chose Isaac. And Paul quotes that. God said to him, in Isaac, your seed will be called. 
Now, God had promised certain things to the seed of Abraham. But he says it's Isaac, through Isaac the seed is going to be coming. Not Ishmael, not the other six kids. They all have the same dad, Abraham. Remember, remember John the Baptist said to the Jews, don't say in yourselves we have Abraham as our father. God could raise up of these stones, children of Abraham. As far as the Jews were concerned, five of the sons of Abraham were nothing. Ishmael and the sons of Keturah, they were nothing. It's Isaac. But he didn't have any better bloodline as far as a connection to Abraham than the others did. But what Paul's arguing is not everyone who is of the bloodline of Abraham or Isaac or Jacob, not all the Israelites, not all of them are included in the promise that God made to the Israelites. For example, Ishmael was not, Isaac was. And he says, and not only that, when Isaac had a wife named Rebekah, she had two children in the womb, and God made a choice between them. Just like he chose Isaac over Ishmael, he chose Jacob over Esau. Now, what Paul is saying all the way through here, he's not talking about Calvinism. He's talking about the fact that God can make a choice among the whole race of Israel to recognize some of them and not all of them as the ones related to his promises. Isaac was related to the promise. Ishmael was not. Jacob was related to the promise. Esau was not. Now, this doesn't tell us whether Ishmael or Esau went to hell. The Bible doesn't indicate at all that either of these men went to hell or nor does the Bible say that Isaac or Jacob went to heaven because that's not discussed. That's not in view. The question is here is not who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. The question is who's going to carry on the family line of promise to bring the Messiah? The promise of Abraham about his seed was not that all his seed would be saved, but that through his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. That's the promise. There's going to be a seed of Abraham. Paul in Galatians 3.16 identifies that seed as Christ. God promised Abraham that through his seed, all the nations would be blessed. Well, that seed didn't come until Jesus came. In the meantime, there'd be some part of the family line that would continue to be in the direct line of that seed that was going to bless the nations. These would be the ones, the earthly people, through whom biology would eventually produce, along with a miracle, the Messiah. So the question is not, is God choosing Isaac to go to heaven, Ishmael to go to hell? No, he's just making a choice between two men who might be equally good and might both be in heaven. But, but going to heaven doesn't mean you're chosen to be the one that the, Abraham, that the Messiah is going to come through. Lots of, lot, the Messiah came through a long line. Not everyone in it was saved, by the way. And some of the people who were not in that line were not lost. Elijah was a saved man, but Jesus didn't descend from him. The point is that in the family of Abraham and the family of Isaac, not every person was chosen to be relevant to the promise God made. The promise God made was that through somebody of, of Abraham's seed, every generation, there'd be a line that moves up till there's a, finally a seed through whom all the nations will be blessed. That's the Messiah. The, it's an earthly nation with an earthly purpose, and that's to have babies and to bring a particular baby into the world at the end of the line, okay? So, Jacob and Esau were not chosen with reference to salvation or eternal destinies. They are chosen with reference to an earthly calling. Which of them would be the one through whom the Messiah would come? Now, of course, neither Jacob nor Esau was the father of Jesus, but they became nations. The nation of Jacob, rather than the nation of Esau, which is Edom, it could have been God could have brought him through Edom, but it's saved around through Jacob, that's Israel. So what he's saying is the Messiah's people are being chosen in Abraham's family line. Every generation, God has to choose which one's going to be the branch that brings the Messiah. The others are not. And there's a lot of kids, a lot of grandkids, a lot of great-grandkids. But every time there's one chosen, not to go to heaven, not to be saved. Some of the ones that weren't chosen might have gone to heaven too, for all we know. But one is chosen to be perpetuate the family line. That's all that Paul is discussing, and that's all, that's all he argues for. Let me show you that he's doing it. He quotes two verses when he talks about God chose Jacob over Esau. He quotes one from the first book of the Old Testament, Genesis, and one from the last book, Malachi. The one from Genesis that he quotes is Genesis 25, 23. The older shall serve the younger. Now, by the way... <clears throat> That's, first of all, that's not a complete quote of the whole prophecy, and we'll look at the whole prophecy and see what it is about. 
But more than that, if it's talking about salvation, what does that have to do with one person serving another? A servant may go to heaven and his master may go to hell. If, if Esau was in fact going to serve Jacob, as the prophecy says, Esau could still be saved and Jacob not. The master isn't always the saved individual, nor the slave the unsaved. This is about earthly status. Now, by the way, also, well, let's look at it. Genesis chapter 25. And verse 23. Rebecca has these two twins kind of duking it out in the womb. She feels conflict going on in there. She says, what's up with that? She goes to inquire of God. I don't know where people went to inquire of God in those days, but she went and inquired of God, and he spoke to her. And he explained it. He said this in verse 23. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. And two peoples, meaning nations, born of you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. The elder what? The elder nation will serve the younger nation. The man Esau never served Jacob. If this is saying that this is a prophecy about the man Esau and the man Jacob, it was a false prophecy. Because the prophecy is that Esau would serve Jacob. Never happened. At one point, Jacob bowed down seven times to his brother Esau, but Esau never bowed to him. In their lifetimes, there was never a situation where the older brothers served the younger brother. But it's about nations, not men. The idea here is that God is choosing the nation of one of these men, Israel, this, of Jacob. And he's not choosing the other nation, the Edomites. Now, Job was probably an Edomite, good chance of it. But he was saved. Being an Edomite didn't mean you're lost. It just means you're not going to be the one whose family brings the Messiah. So what? Lots of people can be saved. Uh, my family didn't bring the Messiah, but I'm saved. Being called to the earthly purpose of bringing the Messiah into the world is one kind of calling, entirely different than the calling of salvation. God chose the nation of Jacob over the nation of Esau, but not for salvation, just for the purpose that he's talking about, that he's been talking about all along. That the whole family of Abram and the whole family of Isaac and even the whole family of Jacob are not relevant to the promises of God. Only some are. And God has every right to do that. If he wants to show mercy on some, he can. Now, the mercy he's talking about here is not salvation, but the mercy he shared to Jacob by allowing him to be in the family line when he didn't have any, hadn't done anything to deserve it. Now, he does talk about hardening certain people like Pharaoh. And, and in this sense... Paul, I think, begins to move to the idea that the portion of the Israelite race that God is now saving happens to agree with those that are really saved. I mean, the, the promise, after all, is a promise of salvation. Abraham was not promised that he would be saved, although he was, nor that his seed, uh, Jacob or uh, Isaac, or Z the salvation of, of these men was not promised. Well, it was promised that through them, someone would come who would save everybody. Gentiles, all the nations of the world would be blessed through it. What, now, Paul's saying that has happened. The Messiah has come, and as usual, part of the family of Abraham is participating in the promise, and the other part is not. In this case, the promise pertains to actual salvation. The promise made to Isaac over Ishmael was not about salvation, nor Jacob over Esau. That's not, that's not what was at issue. But at the end of that line comes the Messiah and the salvation that was promised in the Old Testament, and now that portion of Israel that are involved with the Messiah are, in fact, enjoying the promises. Those who are not are that part of the family that are not related to the promise. Only the remnant will be saved, he says. And that's what he, as soon as this whole discussion is over, that's what he quotes from the Old Testament. Though the children of Israel, he is the sand of the sea, only a remnant should be saved. Now, Therefore, he's not even concerned about issues that, Cal that Calvinists are concerned about, people being elect for salvation. Elect. There's no one being, no one in the Jacob Esau story that's being saved or lost. And it's not even about individuals. It's about the nations that would come from them. And Jacob's nation would bring the Messiah to the world, not Esau's nation. You see, there's no, nothing in this connects with the Calvinist doctrine of unconditional election for salvation. It's not even discussing the subject. It's discussing what Paul started discussing and continues to discuss. How is it that not all the Jews are saved if the Messiah has come? Well, because it's always been the case that only a portion of Abraham's and Isaac and Jacob's family has ever been involved 
in the promises of God. The promise does not relate to bloodline alone because Esau had the exact same bloodline as Jacob had. Esau had Isaac for a father and Abram for a grandfather. So did Jacob. But that, that didn't make a hill of beans difference. God chose one over the other without reference to bloodline. God has never chosen people because of who their ancestors are, but because of other factors, and in this case, faith. Now, there is this discussion that many people stumble over where it says, well, then someone's going to say, well, then how can God find fault for who has resisted his will? He says, well, who are you, O man, to resist? Who are you who answers against God? That's, of course, verse 19, Romans 9, 19. You will say to me then, why does he then still find fault? For who can resist his will? Now, you have to understand these are rhetorical questions. The questioner is not looking for an answer. They're, they're making a statement. Who has resisted God's will? The suggestion is obviously no one has. God's will is going to be done. So how can he find fault? Which means he can't because everyone's just doing what it's his will to do. How can God find fault if in fact everyone does his will? No one can resist his will. The questions, obviously, you have to understand, these are statements made in the form of rhetorical questions. The argument is God should not be able to find fault then because nobody can resist his will. Now, where did the, 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 the person get that impression? Well, they're making apparently the same kind of mistake that, that the Calvinist makes. They're assuming that Paul is saying, because God chose Jacob over Esau and showed special mercy to him, that this extends to all decisions about all things, that God must control all decisions of all people and makes all the choices. But if that's true, then how can God find fault? And that's a good question. That's a good question for Calvinists because they're the ones who believe that no one can resist his will. They're the ones who say that God's will is always done. They're the ones who say that God's sovereign will, he sovereignly works all things according to the dictates of his will and no one can resist it. So how, if I'm saved because God determined I'd be saved and it wasn't my choice and my neighbor is going to hell not because he chose it, because God chose it. How can he find fault since the guy's just doing what God wanted him to do? His going to hell it was God's will, or else God would have chosen to be saved. He, God's will is reflected in everything that happens. So my neighbor who's rejecting Christ, it's because God determined he should reject Christ, and therefore how can God find fault? Now this, of course, question has been raised by the church fathers before Augustine. Before there was such a thing as Calvinism, there were the church fathers. And they knew of this kind of doctrine from a, a, a heresy called Manichaeanism. Whenever church fathers were addressing this matter of whether God controls and ordains everything, they were addressing Manichaeanism, which taught that. And they called it heresy. And they argued it just this way. They said, if God is in fact determining who's going to be righteous and who's going to be unrighteous, how can he find fault? You can't blame somebody who's just doing the will of God. Why does God blame them? The church fathers were asking the same question. And I'm going to tell you how you, I think, should understand this. But, interestingly enough, Augustine was a Manichaean before he was a Christian. And he invented Calvinism later. Now, is there a connection? I don't know. It's just that the things that Augustine came up with, all the church fathers for the first three centuries thought those were Manichaean ideas. Then a Manichaean becomes a Christian theologian, and lo and behold, these Manichaean ideas are now part of Christianity. What is the idea? That God ordains everything that happens. That's what someone is misunderstanding Paul to say. He's not saying God ordains everything that happens. He's saying God makes the choices he wants to make and has every right to make them. It doesn't mean he interferes with everything, but he does choose which of the line of Abraham's seed he's going to use to bring forth the Messiah. That's all that Paul has argued. But if someone extrapolates from that, well, then God does all the chooses everything, everything is his will, well then of course it does raise a serious question. How can he find fault? And if you ask a Calvinist that, they'll get the same answer Paul gave. Who are you to answer against God, O oh man? That's, the, that's one of the Calvinist's favorite statements. Who are you to answer against God? God can do what he wants to. He's sovereign. Well that is true. God is sovereign. He can do what he wants to. But what does he want to do is the real question. Does he want a whole bunch of people to go to hell? The Bible seems to say he doesn't. So why would you say he does? 
Uh, <coughs> now, what's wrong with this person who's asking the question? The Calvinist says this person has faulty logic. There's two propositions raised in these rhetorical questions. First proposition is God ordains everything that happens. That is, no one can resist his will. It always is going to happen. Second proposition, God cannot find fault because of that first one. Because no one can resist God's will, God cannot find fault. That's basically the argument of these two questions. The Calvinist says the first proposition is true. No one can resist the will. But the second proposition is false because it follows faulty human logic. Well, what other kind of logic is there? Well, there's divine logic. Well, how does that work? I don't know. Who are you to answer against God? That's just for God to know. Only God understands these things. But, but the, the Calvinist thinks the questioner is right in assuming that God ordains everything, but wrong in saying, therefore, God cannot find fault with people. In fact, it's the other way. I believe Paul would agree that if, in fact, God ordains everything that happens, that God could not find fault with people for doing what he ordained should happen. He disagrees with the first proposition, and therefore the second one does not follow. It is not so that no one has resisted his will, and he points it right out to this person. Who are you who's arguing against God? Isn't that resisting his will? Well, if you're not arguing against God, you're not resisting his will, but isn't arguing against God, isn't that a form of resistance of God's will? Can people resist God's will? Yes, you can. You're doing it. You say, who has resisted? Well, who are you? You're doing it. The point he's making is, if you're saying that no one can resist God's will, you're saying what I'm not saying. And you're proving that men can resist God's will because you're resisting his will. You know, Luke said this in Luke chapter 7 and verse 30. Luke chapter 7 and verse 30 says, the scribes and the Pharisees rejected the will of God for themselves in not being baptized by John. Wait, Luke said it was the will of God for them to be baptized by John, but they rejected that will and didn't do it. It says the scribes and the Pharisees rejected the will of God for themselves by not being baptized by John. So, Luke 7.30. Clearly, it was God's will for them to be baptized by John, but they rejected it and didn't do it. So can someone resist God's will? Apparently. In fact... At the climax of Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7, he says, you hard, stiff-necked, you know, rebels, how long will you resist the Holy Spirit? Well, they did for a long time, because you can. They can. Jesus said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times I would have gathered your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you wouldn't. I was trying to gather you. That was my will. I wouldn't have tried if it wasn't my will. My will was that you should come. Otherwise, I wouldn't have wasted my breath calling you. But you wouldn't come. Can you resist God's will? Of course. Paul never suggests anywhere in his writings that people cannot resist God's will. He's not saying it here either. It's the critic of Paul that says, who implies by his question, no one can resist God's will. And Paul says, well, you're doing it. Who are you? You're arguing against God. But then he says this. Doesn't the potter have the right and the power of the clay that if he wants to, he can take one lump of clay and make two vessels and use one for special purposes and the other not for special purposes. Now, who's the lump of clay here? Paul's obviously taking the analogy from Jeremiah 18, where Jeremiah went to the potter's house, watched the potter work, and God says, are you not like this clay, O Israel? Israel is the clay. That is, the nation of Israel is the clay. God's the potter. What's he do? He takes one lump of clay, the nation of Israel, and makes two separate categories. Two vessels. One for ordinary purposes. That is, they're going to be just like any Gentile. They're not going to be special. And the other is for special purposes, Paul says. Now, it's just like what he did with Abraham's children. He, he, Ishmael's an ordinary person, but God chose Isaac for special purposes out of the family. When Ishmael had two sons, God chose Esau to be an ordinary person like anybody else. Jacob not to be an ordinary person, but he was called for a special purpose. God can take that one lump of clay, which is the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and from that lump he can make two categories. He's been doing it all along. He's been doing it from, from Abraham's day on. What Paul says is there's a consistency. There's no discussion of Calvinism. There's a discussion of Israel and of God's right to say not all are Israel who are of Israel. 
There never has been a time when everybody who was of Abraham or Isaac or Jacob was the true Israel. That's a covenantal thing, not a racial thing. If you're faithful to God and his covenant is with you, now he made a covenant with Isaac and with Jacob without reference to their obedience, but his covenant with Israel after, after the Exodus was based on obedience. You obey my voice and keep my covenant, you'll be my people. Still, that's still the case, only it's a different covenant. There's a new covenant. Keeping that covenant means you embrace Jesus as your Lord. You're a disciple. You follow him. If you're a Jew, that's great. If you're a Gentile, equally great. No difference. No difference Jew and Gentile in God's eyes. Just following Christ is what defines everything. Now, I only have a few minutes. Let me, let me skip to the end of chapter 11. I know I skipped over 10. There's a lot of discussion there, but it's not determinative of where Paul's going specifically. But when we come to... Right after his discussion of the olive tree and the branches broken off, the branches put on, and so forth. He says this in verse uh, Romans 11, uh, verse 25. So that you may not be claimed to be wiser than you are, brothers and sisters, I want you to understand this mystery. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, out of Zion will come the deliverer. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them. To take away their sins. Obviously the new covenant. Jeremiah 31 said the new covenant was he'll remember their sins no more. So his covenant with them to take away their sins is the new covenant in Christ. Okay? Now... What is he saying there in verse 25 and 26? It says hardness, the way it reads in the older versions, is hardness in part has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles are saved. And then it says, and so all Israel will be saved. When I was a dispensationalist, I had to read some words into this because I thought Paul was saying there's a temporary hardness that has come on the nation of Israel. That won't last. Eventually that hardness will be gone. And Israel, all Israel will be saved. So that while the Gentiles are being saved in large numbers, God is temporarily hardening Israel. But I thought that verse 26 began with the word then. Then all Israel will be saved. Like there's a sequence here. First, Israel's hardened. Second, the Gentiles come in. Third, Israel is no longer hardened, and, they, and they're saved then. So I saw this sort of as a discussion about eschatology. Someday, Israel, the ones who are rejecting Christ, will in fact be saved once the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. That's what I understood, because all dispensationalists understand that, when I, I was a dispensationalist. So, you need to import some words that aren't there. First of all, you need to have the word temporary in verse 25, and you have to add the word then at the beginning of verse 26. Because that would suggest there's a sequence of events. A temporary hardening of Israel has happened until the Gentiles come in, and then after they come in, Israel will be saved. Okay? That makes good sense if those, ver if those words are implied. They're certainly not stated. But if you want to imply them, you can. But that's not necessary, and it doesn't fit Paul's general teaching in this passage. He has just described Israel as an olive tree in the immediate context before He's still talking about this. What did he say about Israel? He said, well, the Jewish branches that are unbelievers, they're not on it anymore. They're not Israel anymore. Are they going to be added on later on? Well, he does say, if they don't remain in unbelief, they can be grafted in. So he's basically saying any Jew who's living in Paul's time, or any time, who's an unbeliever, can become a believer and become part of Israel again. That's what he says. It's God is able to graft them in if they, if they don't remain in unbelief, he says. And even those Gentiles who have been attached by faith, they can be cut off, he said in verse 22, if they don't continue. So, you know, I'm in Israel, but if I, if I abandon Christ, I'm not in Israel anymore. Israel's not a, not a, I'm, listen, I'm 50% I'm Irish, 25% English, and the rest is mongrel. Maybe even those 2%, two parts are mongrel too, but, but the point is, I, I'll be that till the day I die. No choice I will ever make can ever change the fact of my ancestry and my race. 
Same with you. We're all the same that way. We all are stuck with whatever we are, and we're stuck with that particular thing until we die. Nothing changes. But being in Israel can change. Somebody who's been cut off that tree can be grafted in. Someone who's in there can be cut off. Paul says all that. Israel is not a racial thing. It's connected by covenant to God thing. <clears throat> the new covenant through Christ. <clears throat> now, he says, a hardness of, in part has happened in Israel. They've, they've made it clearer in this particular tradition. It says part of Israel has been, has been uh, hardened. Well, that's different than saying all of Israel has been temporarily hardened. There's not a reference here to anything temporary. That part of Israel that was hardened in Paul's day, most of them probably remained hardened until the day they died. They might not have. They could have gotten saved, but most of them probably didn't. Part of the Jews are hardened. That's not temporary necessarily. That's, that's the way it is. It's that way in Paul's day. It's that way in our day. It may be that on the day Jesus comes back, there will still be part of Israel that's hardened. There's no suggestion this is a temporary thing. And it is until, now that makes it sound temporary, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. But the word until, although it sometimes does speak of a sequence, of course, it often speaks of purpose rather than sequence. And it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean, uh, you know, it's like, uh, I'm trying to think of an example. If I said, uh, you know, I will love my wife until I'm in my 90s. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that I expect to stop loving her if I live beyond my 90s. It just means that, you know, I'll, at least when I'm in my 90s, I'm committed. But I may be committed longer. That's not a good example because that does almost suggest I might not be afterwards. But that's, there are statements actually that God does make in the Old Testament. That talks about, you know, when he says to Jacob, I will not leave you until I've fulfilled everything I promised you. Does that mean, okay, after I fulfill that, I'm leaving you? No, it means my purpose is to fulfill this, and I'm not going to give up on that project before it's done. He's not saying, but then I'm going to change. When he says hardness has happened a part of Israel until the fullness of, of the Gentiles comes. That doesn't mean he's going to stop hardening Israel or stop bringing in Gentiles, but his purpose is to bring in the fullness of the Gentiles. And he's not, and this isn't going to change before that's accomplished. Will it change afterward? Well, that's not stated or implied. If he says it's going to change, then fine. And dispensations think he does say it's going to change in verse 26. So all Israel will be saved. <coughs> so means in this way. The Greek word thus. So. In this manner. It does not mean then or after this. It's not a chronological word. It's a word of how something is happening, not when it's going to happen. In this way, all Israel is saved. Now remember, the question at the beginning of the chapter is, that is implied is, what about these promises of God that, all, that Israel will be saved? He goes through this. Well, not everyone who's of Israel is the Israel that those promises apply to. Only the remnant shall be saved. But there's even more than the remnant. There's also Gentile branches that will be grafted into Israel. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Not just the Jewish part, but the Gentile part. You see, true, part of Israel has been hardened. But one of the, one of the consolations of that is that a lot of Gentiles are coming in. And in this way, that is by the Gentiles coming in and joining, in this way, all Israel, not just the Jewish part, but the Gentile part of Israel, all Israel will be saved this way. And he quotes, you know, uh, one of those scriptures about how God's going to save Zion and save Israel. But he's not saying this is a future thing that applies to natural Israel. Now, my dispensational friends, they argue, listen, do you know how many times Paul uses the word Israel in this whole section 9 through 11? A lot. I don't remember the number they tell me, but I don't remember. I don't care. But the point is, let's say he uses the word Israel 20 times in these three chapters. That may be close to the truth. may not be all. But let's say it is so. And he distinguishes between Israel and the Gentiles in most of these. So when he says all Israel will be saved, for the most part, he's been using the word Israel through this whole section to mean the Jews. Why would he not mean the Jews in verse 26 when he says all Israel will be saved? Because he's already said in chapter 9 that only a remnant of Israel will be saved. 
and that not all who are called Israel are the Israel who are going to be saved. That's why he made that plain as he opened the discussion. His thesis was stated in chapter 9, verse 6. The rest has been developing that thesis. God saves Israel, true. He's doing it now. He's been doing it ever since Jesus came. He'll do it until the end of time. But that's not all Jews. That includes the fullness of the Gentiles being coming in. That includes Gentile branches being grafted into the tree that's called Israel. And some Jews being cut off, and not necessarily temporarily. If Paul was suggesting that the branches that were cut off, he's speaking in the present tense, in his time. He's describing things in his own day. At the present time, he says, there is a remnant. And at the present time, some Jews are cut off from the tree because they don't believe. He said, if they don't remain in they can be put on. So he's talking about his own time. There's a possibility, if they want, to come back in, but they... That's up to them. They may not. He does not predict that all the Jews who are unbelievers this day will someday turn around and become Christians because they didn't. And they didn't in any generation of Jews since then either. There's no suggestion it'll happen in a future generation. Paul doesn't talk necessarily about future generations. Now, there are some statements he makes uh, in the end of chapter 11. I can't get into in detail. I should actually say something about it. Because some people say this does look about like it's about the future. Because he says <clears throat> in verse 15... If their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Okay, so he says the Jews' rejection of Christ has, has caused the gospel to go to the Gentiles, and it's been, you know, the salvation of the world. What shall their acceptance be if not life from the dead? And, and he also says uh, a little later, he says something very much like that. I don't, it, it's a similar kind of statement. Can't find it just at the moment. Now, some say, you see, Paul is predicting that they will be accepted. The ones who have rejected him will someday be accepted. Their rejection has had good results. How much more will their acceptance have good results? Is he predicting or hypothesizing? He would say it the same way in either case. If he's speaking hypoth hypothetically, he could say... Their rejection has been the salvation of the Gentiles. What will their acceptance be? That is, if they accept Christ and he accepts them, what would that, think how great that would be. It's hypothetical. He doesn't predict that it'll happen anywhere. He nowhere predicts it'll happen. But he knows it could happen if they do not remain in unbelief, they can be grafted into that tree again, he says. Wouldn't that be great? Think of how great that would be. If their rejection has been so fruitful, what would their acceptance be? This is a hypothetical situation that Paul could easily hope for, but he doesn't predict. And so, uh, one other thing that we have to talk about in this, it says in verse 28, as regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their ancestors. So some say, see, they're still God's chosen people. Even though they reject the gospel, because they're ancestors, God still loves them. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Okay, so if God called the Jews once, that's irrevocable. His call on the Jews is irrevocable. Well, you're assuming he means Jews all the way through here. Paul has been saying all along, it's not being Jewish that defines you as Israel. It is true. God does love Israel. And he even loves the ones, frankly, that are resisting him. But that's not what I think Paul's saying. He says, as regards the gospel, they, meaning the Jews he's been talking about, are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards, in the Greek it says, the election. The election? What is the election? They are beloved. Now, there's some who are enemies and there's some who are beloved. The, the beloved ones are the election. Who are they? Well, you only have to look back a few, cha a few verses. In chapter 11, verse 7. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. In the Greek it says, the election obtained it. It's not translated that way, but in the Greek it's the same word. The election in both places. Israel, the nation, has by and large failed to come into salvation. They are enemies of the gospel. It says, enemies of God. 
But the election, which he clearly means the faithful remnant who have received Christ, they are the election. They have obtained it. The election are beloved. He, he still distinguishes between two groups in Israel. There's those who are the enemies and there's those who are the beloved because they are the election, according to the election. Now, we know he started with the, the, the believing Jews because he says, you know, in verse, uh, uh, whatever it is, verse 8, 9, or whatever it is, where he says, even today, there's a, uh, a remnant according to election. The election are the remnant. And they're the ones who are beloved. And the ones who are enemies, God may love his enemies too, but that's not what he's, the point he's making here. He's not saying, be, even though they're enemies, they're going to be saved because God loves them. Well, God loves a lot of people he doesn't save. And certainly, he's talking in the present tense. The Jews of his own day, who are rejecting Christ, is he saying they're beloved and therefore going to be saved? Well, they weren't, most of them. Most Jews never have been saved. So his statement does not seem to imply that in spite of the fact that they're enemies, God still loves them in a saving manner or still elects them. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. What did God call? Who did God call? Who, who is the gift of salvation to? To the true Israel. But notice what Paul said about the call. Who are the called he's talking about? It says in uh, Romans 9, earlier in the discussion, verse 24, including us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Well, who are the called? In Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good of those who are the called according to the purpose. That's the Christians. The calling of God rests upon the Christians. The called are not only Jews, but also Gentiles, Paul says in Romans 9. So, yeah, the callings of God are irrevocable. He, he calls all believers to be his people. He always has, always will. Israelites mostly are not believers. And the ones who are not believers are not called. He does not have a covenant relationship with them. They're not elect. Only those who are in Christ are elect because only Christ himself is elect. So that's how it goes. That's pretty much how the argument goes. Now, just know whenever you read Romans 9 through 11 or discuss with anyone, two, there's different ways to look at it. Some think Paul is saying the Jews aren't saved, but that's temporary. They will be. Others say the Jews aren't saved because they never were predicted to be saved. Only the remnant of them were predicted to be saved, and that has happened and is happening throughout the whole age of the church. It's happening. Every Jew who comes to Christ is saved, and that's the faithful remnant. So, but he says, but that also includes Gentiles on this tree that's called Israel. So, I'd love to talk about Romans 12. I won't, but it begins, therefore, I beseech you by the mercies of God. In other words, all these talk about is an exposition of the mercies of God. In view of the mercies of God, I beseech you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And he goes on, and the rest of the book talks about how it is that when you present your bodies to God as a response to his mercy, and you renew your mind, you begin to live a different way. And that different way is described many aspects of it in that very one chapter. There's a lot of instructions just in chapter 12 alone, but then 13 and 14 and 15 also. And so, uh, but since those things are kind of, the meaning of those passages are kind of on the surface. You know, it's interesting. It's nice to think there's some part of Romans that isn't controversial. I think. Maybe there's some controversy there too that I'm not thinking of. But the truth is, the part that's controversial, the part that we need to sort out, the part that's a little not so obvious on the surface, we kind of covered that material. We, we, we will not have time to cover that, which is obvious to any reader, which is, for the most part, the rest. Many, many comments could be made that might unpack it, but you can get those on your own. I'm sorry that we couldn't cover the whole book. It's, I'm discovering it's impossible for me I don't know if other teachers who've taught Romans in this school have gotten through Romans fully. I've taught Romans here probably five times, maybe six, I'm not sure. I've never gotten much further than I got this time. 
<laughs> and I announced at the beginning that I intended to be different this time. If you listen to my first lecture, I said, I've never gotten all the way through. I usually get through the first box and I'd have to skip over the rest. I hope not to do that this time. Well, not all hopes are realized. And so <laughs> this is the way we end it. I know that you guys have a way of ending the week, so I'm going to just turn it back over to you, Jesse, and you can do what you want.